Marvel called Jesus the Nazarene mutant in a recent X-Men comic. I'm sure the Christian right will react like normal people and just turn the other cheek. Oh, who am I kidding? As long-time viewers will know, I have little patience for the perpetually offended, these people who see the slightest thing that doesn't match their worldview and then lose their minds. And outside of feminists, none are more perpetually offended than the Christian right. It takes very little to set them off, as they recently demonstrated in their faux outrage over an X-Men comic. I saw this page from Immortal X-Men 1 making the rounds among the usual suspects, with several of them claiming that this line from Exodus about the Nazarene mutant was an attack on Christians. Now, I didn't know this book was out because I, like most people, don't read X-Men comics. I didn't even know Marvel had relaunched the entire line. Again. This is apparently a follow-up to the fallout of the trial of Magneto, and the premise of the issue is that Magneto wants to step down from the Quiet Council, so a spot needs to be replaced. I could explain what the Quiet Council is, but I don't care and neither do you. Whatever you just came up with in your head is more interesting than what it actually is. What you do need to know is that the entire issue is told from Sinister's perspective, and Marvel has decided that he's stone cold fucknuts now, so nothing he says makes any sense. He's like Dr. Evil, but dumber and not funny. The gist of the story is that he's scheming, and he thinks he knows everything that'll happen because he's cloned Moira McTaggart, who was recently revealed to be a mutant with the power of reincarnation. He's been running experiments on different timelines, killing the clone every time things turn unfavorable, and then uploading his alternate version's memories into his current body. That takes Jonathan Hickman's convoluted nonsense about plant resurrection and makes it even worse, but hey, that's current Marvel. In the middle of all of this, Exodus goes to speak to Hope Summers. Hope, along with four other mutants, resurrects mutants who are killed. Xavier uses Cerebro to scan all mutants' minds constantly and makes backups of them so if anyone's killed, they can be brought back with their memories intact. Of course, since these are just memories and not the person's actual mind, the real person actually died, and they're just replaced with a plant clone from Kokoa. This was confirmed by Jonathan Hickman in a previous X-Men story in which X-23, Darwin, and Sink get trapped in an alternate space that has accelerated time, so that for them about a hundred years pass, but in real time it's a few days or weeks. When they manage to get out, they've lost their powers, and Laura sacrifices herself to let Sink escape. During that hundred years, Sink and Laura fell in love, but because she's cut off from Cerebro when she's killed, all of her memories are lost. Instead, her reboot is from the last upload, so when Sink makes bedroom eyes at her, she's angry, not turned on, because she's not the real Laura. That one died. She's just a clone. Of a clone. D never mind. So that's what Exodus walks in on. Exodus, for those who don't know, is a mutant religious nut. He was augmented by Apocalypse and served as the leader of Magneto's Acolytes for a time. He's an Omega-level psionic, and his powers are increased by people's faith in him and his faith in himself, hence the religious theme. Hope was the first mutant born after M-Day, after Scarlet Witch declared no more mutants. Hope would later combine with the Phoenix and, with Wanda's help, undo Wanda's actions, restoring the mutant race. This, along with Hope's status as the first mutant born after M-Day, resulted in some mutants seeing her as a messiah. I'm giving you the context so that this entire thing makes sense. So what happens is that Exodus goes to Hope to try to talk her into taking Magneto's seat, and he calls her Messiah. They have some back and forth about that, and Exodus says, quote, The Nazarene mutant inspired a church among the humans by raising a couple from the dead. I just watched you beat that in five minutes. And that's it. There's no further mention of the Nazarene mutant, no commentary about the truth or validity of the church he inspired, not even a casual nod to the fact that within the Marvel Universe, Christians are one of the leading groups who persecutes mutants, making Exodus' revelation ironic. Just two sentences in one panel on one page that's hand-waved away by Hope as, quote, acolyte stuff. And for the mere suggestion that in the fictional universe of Marvel, where mythological figures like Thor and Hercules walk among men, the Christian right got pissy that this could apply to the mythological figure of Jesus, too. I guess it's okay to fictionalize everyone else's mythology, just not theirs. Of course, they might argue that Jesus isn't a myth, but a real person, which would be a valid argument if literature and films weren't littered with fictionalized versions of historical people, like having the former emperor of France be transported into a modern mall, or turning the president of the United States into a vampire hunter, or claiming a first century apocalyptic preacher was actually a deity who impregnated a 14-year-old girl, with her consent, so he could father himself to understand what it's like to be human, despite being all-knowing. We fictionalize historical figures all the time, some of them better than others, and without the centuries of oppression, violence, and indoctrinating kids. You might then say, well, it's different because Marvel said Jesus was a mutant, not a god. 
And that would be a good argument if all the other mythological figures weren't depicted as essentially alien races from pocket dimensions and not actual gods. None of that changes that they were worshipped as gods, just like nothing Exodus said removes the idea that the Nazarene mutant was worshipped as a god. It's that in the Marvel Universe, like all other gods, Jesus isn't what you think he is. You might then say, well, what does that mean for all the Christian characters in Marvel? Doesn't that insult them? No more than it does all the non-Christian characters who worship all the other pantheons depicted in the Marvel comics. You might then say, well, what about the cover? It's mocking Jesus because it's Da Vinci's The Last Supper. Yes, that famous painting everyone under the sun's done homages to for hundreds of years. Are you offended by all those too, or is it just this one? You might then say, well, what about when it was released? It's on Easter. Well, the book came out on March 30th, and Easter falls on April 17th, three weeks later. So, no, it wasn't released on Easter, and doesn't appear to have anything at all to do with Easter, but thank you for stretching. You might then say, well, they wouldn't do this with other religions, except they have. Or are you talking about that religion with the illiterate guy who somehow wrote down texts dictated to him by an angel, who then went on to marry a nine-year-old girl, with her consent, and later flew to heaven on the Pegasus? Yes, we all know they would have an explosive response. Are you saying you think that response would be appropriate? Are you saying you want to kill people who talk about your religion? Not just that you could, but that you should do this thing. Or are you admitting that you're too cowardly to act on your actual intent? It's ironic that the people who spent the better part of last decade complaining about how progressives are oversensitive about identity politics are now being oversensitive about identity politics. This is the same group of people who've been arguing for free speech and the ability to say things the left might not like, especially when it comes to race, sex, and sexuality. No word, no comment, no joke, no slur should be off limits. Unless, of course, they're on the receiving end of it. They're playing the same game the progressives play, or really, they're going back to their old M.O., because that's where the progressives got it from. They learned how to perpetually whine about nonsense from the Christian right, and then perfected it by actually having something legitimate to whine about. If you're offended by these two lines, the worst, most bigoted lines ever written in the history of Marvel Comics, I will remind you that offense is taken, not given. When you say you're offended, I'm still waiting to hear your fucking point. No one has any obligation to believe what you believe. The overwhelming majority of people in the world aren't Christian. Nobody has to follow your religious views or include them in their stories or alter their stories to protect your feelings. This is a standard you want to apply to the left so you can say anything you want about them. As you so constantly and humbly remind everyone, you're the better people with the better ideas and values, so you should have no problem following your own better standards. People get to talk about your religion, to fictionalize it, to poke holes in your doctrine, just like you want to do to everyone else. Your religion doesn't get a pass. And just like I say to the progressives who bitch about stories they don't like, just because a character in a book makes a statement doesn't mean that's the opinion held by the author. Exodus is a villain. He's going to say mean things because that's what villains do, as you so frequently reminded the left. So you bitching about it when it's done to you makes you sound like a bunch of hypocrites. I get it, though. You want to be the victim. Our culture now places value on victimhood, stupid as that is, and you desperately want to be a part of that. But you can't because you're not victims. Though not from a lack of believing you are. The Christian right has long had a persecution complex. They believe they're the real victims of oppression in the United States because they're no longer allowed to force other people to follow their religious views. So they like to claim they're being persecuted for their faith, like it's 122 AD, even though that literally doesn't happen in any state anywhere in this country. Even if there were a case of it happening, this isn't it. This is a fictional story. It's not real. So if you believe Jesus is a real God, it doesn't affect your actual beliefs. You can continue to believe whatever you want to believe, and in Marvel Comics, a fictional universe, Jesus can be a mutant because these are two separate things that don't affect each other. Like I say to the woke left, nobody has to agree with your kooky politics or your religious woo. If someone wants to fictionalize Jesus, they get to do it, and you have the option not to buy the book you already weren't going to buy. Stop trying to play the victim. You're not a victim. You've never been a victim in this country, and you're not likely to become one anytime soon. I understand that since you digivolved back into Bigotmon, you might be feeling a little testy because your attack on an actual oppressed group of people, who you ironically oppress, isn't going quite the way you planned. But damseling like a soccer player who got knocked down when no one was within 100 yards of you is just embarrassing. But what do I know? I'm just some guy.